Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We praise you for your word, which is the truth. We have a ready reception for it. We're taking hold of what's offered. We thank you that we're going to be hearers and doers of it. We thank you that it's sown in our heart and mind. It's going to bring forth fruit. We thank you for all that you accomplished this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you on the subject of spiritual growth, where we grow up, we increase, we multiply, we move on in the things of God, and we go on into perfection. So we brought messages on that subject from the Old Testament and from the New Testament. And as we see wh where God is taking us to, that we're going on to perfection, we've got to realize that He's wanting us to come to perfection in our life now in this life. And we can. We must understand what this is all about. We've talked about the fact from Genesis, the word perfect is a word which actually means without blemish, undefiled, without spot, and upright. That's what the word means when you look this up in the Hebrew. In fact, it's even translated that in many different areas uh, of the Old Testament, as we've already pointed out to you. Forty-four times without blemish, up translated upright, translated without spot or uprightly. It's referring to the fact that a person is considered without blemish, undefiled, without spot, and upright. We saw the fact that in the Old Testament, there were those who were walking in line with God's laws according to His commandments. We see in Luke chapter 1, verse 6, there was in the days of Herod, or verse 6 that we want, they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. This is talking about Zacharias and Elizabeth. Notice, this is someone who was not born again, walking in all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord blameless. So people were walking blameless as they were walking in line with God's Word in the Old Testament era. Now, and we saw the scripture that as we are growing up spiritually and we lay the foundation in our life, that we are going to go on into perfection. Hebrews 6.1 says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us, that's all of us, go on unto perfection. Not laying again the foundation, the foundation of all these different things that need to be established in our life. So in order to go on to perfection, can we do it? Yes, we can. What's going to be the, the sign or showing forth that we have entered into that? We're going to be talking about that tonight. Believers can do it. How are we going to be able to do it? It's going to be through God accomplishing it in our life, and He is going to perform this word through His word, His word in our life, this work. Over in 1 Peter, chapter 1, and verse 18. For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Jesus came. He had to walk the walk that Adam had failed. And he was tempted with sin in all points, yet without sin. And we see that he was without blemish. He was without spot. And he went to the cross to pay the price for sin and accomplish the redemption which he did for us. We see that after Jesus was raised from the dead, and now he is in his high priestly ministry as the priest over this covenant, we see it speaks of him, and it says in Hebrews 7, 26, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, <laughs> and made higher than the heavens. Jesus is holy, he is harmless, or one who is free from any kind of evil or guile or anything, undefiled and separate from sinners. What did Jesus bring into manifestation? He brought a covenant, a new covenant, into manifestation that we now could be reconciled unto God. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7, it says, regarding the first covenant, it says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. But there was fault with the first covenant. He talks about that. He says, for finding fault in what? The first covenant. With them, he saith, behold, the days cometh, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. A new covenant was going to come. And this was one that would not find any fault, or the word fault means any kind of blame. Otherwise, this would be a covenant that would be no fault, blameless before God that would produce what he purposed. He says, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, 
Because they continued not in my covenant, I regarded them not, saith the Lord. This is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I'll be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. In the new covenant now, God takes his word, he writes it in our heart, and writes it in our mind. It is through God's word that we're going to go on unto perfection in our life. He goes on and says, They shall not teach every man his neighbor, every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. Everybody now can know the Lord in the New Testament. I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. He does not remember them any longer. Now, this covenant that had blame has been replaced by a covenant that has no blame, a blameless covenant. And through the word now written in us, in our heart and mind, that blameless covenant will produce blameless and undefiling work of God in our life. It will bring us to the place of not having any spot. It will bring us to the place of being holy before Him. And we will go on into perfection in the Lord. We must see in Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 4, it says, According as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, this is before the foundation of the world, this is what God purposed from the very beginning, that we, talking about born-again Christians, should be holy and without blame or without blemish before Him in love. We've already, he already purposed that we're supposed to be without blame and we're supposed to be without blemish and holy before God. Therefore, we can be holy, we can be without blame, we can be without blemish, walking blameless without spot and undefiled before the Lord. God certainly would never tell us to be, that we're going to be something and choose us that way if we never could accomplish it and see it arriving in our life. In 1 Peter chapter 1, we see in verse 3 how this is going to begin to come to pass. It says in 1 Peter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again. This means to be born again. We've been born again. Unto a lively, or this really means a living hope. It's a verb. This is why he translates it a living hope. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And what is our hope? That now we can become like Jesus. We can go on into perfection. We can be holy as we see that now we can possess everything that God has given us in Christ. And what has He brought us to? An inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled. Undefiled. That means that as you possess your inheritance which is undefiled, it is going to produce the effect in you that you're going to be undefiled. You are going to be blameless. You are going to be holy before the Lord. You are going to have gone on into perfection. This inheritance is undefiled. It fades not away. It's reserved in heaven for you. All the promises of God belong to us. And as we enter into His rest by possessing the promises of God, we are going to go on into perfection. And we are going to be blameless and holy before the Lord. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we see over here in verse 8. It says, Who shall also confirm... Or this means, this word confirm means to, to make something sure or steadfast or establish it. He shall confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of us are going to be blameless if we have followed the way of the Lord. So don't think that you're just going to walk around in the ways of sin. Or you're going to walk in the flesh or just kind of do their best. No. You are going on to perfection. You are going to come to the place through the working of the Word of God to be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. How is this going to happen? Well, we talk about this particular word here, this number 950, Rabbeo. It all comes from the origin from a word 949, same words, what it means, just another form of it. And we see how God is going to accomplish this, bringing us to the place of being blameless. In Hebrews chapter 2, over here in verse 2, he says this, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, this is this number 949, it was firm, it was stable, it was sure. God's word is sure. It is steadfast, and it will accomplish his work. We see further speaking about the word of God in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. We have a more sure word, same word, 
steadfast, firm word that is sure and steadfast. It's a more sure word of prophecy. What is it? It's the word of God. And we can walk in line with this word, and it's going to bring forth God's work. We're going to be steadfast because he's going to bring us the place of being blameless as we bring forth fruit in our life. We see over in Hebrews, in chapter 6, verse 19, speaking about hope being the anchor of our soul. Hope is the anchor of our soul, keeping us steadfast in the area of the soulless realm, our will, intellect, and emotions, both sure and steadfast. Here they translate it steadfast. God's word, which is sure and steadfast, produces hope, confident expectancy, keeping your soul in line, because that's where the battleground is with the enemy. And your soul in line with walking in his ways is going to enable you to bring forth fruit. You're going to be able to conquer all the enemies. And you're going to be able to be bringing forth that which shows fact, the fact that you are blameless, you are undefiled, you are holy, as you bring forth fruit before the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 3, and verse 6, it speaks of the fact that Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we? We are the house of Christ, if the condition is not automatic just because you're born again. If we hold the confidence and the rejoice and the hope firm or steadfast, stable and steadfast, firm unto the end. In other words, how are you going to come to the place of being blameless? You're going to be the house of God. This accomplished the building. The building is going to be accomplished. You're going to be full of fruit. You're going to have the prom promises of God. You're going to possess your inheritance. And you are going to come to the place of being the house of Christ because you are steadfast in, on the word of God unto the end. We also see in verse 14, we are made partakers of Christ. Remember, we're not a partaker of Christ until we possess the promises. A partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast again unto the end. Being steadfast upon the word is a key for you to come to the place of perfection. God wants you steadfast, firm, fixed, so established in your life, that's the way you live. That's the way you think. That's the way you speak. That's the way you walk. That's all you do. You just respond to the Word of God at all times. Now, in 2 Peter, we see again this word used over in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. And here it says, Rather, wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election. The word election is being chosen. Same word for being chosen. Make your calling and election sure, steadfast, set, stable, firm, established. You know, For if you do these things, you shall never fall. How are you going to make your calling and your being chosen sure that it's going to be a sure deal? See, it's not a sure deal until we have walked in line with his ways and done what he says. You're going to make your calling and election or your choosing sure that it's set. Because what are you going to do? You're going to do all the things that he talked about, which is you're going to walk in line with his word according to the knowledge of God. You're going to be temperate in all things. You're going to be having patience in the area of your soul, steadfast, which is what uh, the verses prior to this talk about down here, where you... Uh, moral excellent, virtue, knowledge, the knowledge of God, temperance, which is that which is self-control, keeps your body in line, patience, steadfastness in the area of your soul so you don't give place to the enemy, godliness, being a hearer and a doer of God's word and, sh and showing respect and reverence to God as you walk in his ways, brotherly kindness, showing love to all brothers and sisters in Christ, and charity, love towards all. And it talks about these things are supposed to be in you and abounding in you. And it says that you're to give diligence to make your calling and election sure. That tells you it's not sure until we do these things. And when it talks about doing these things, this is the present tense, meaning continuous, repeated action. This is going to be your lifestyle. And what's going to be the result when you do these things? You make your calling and election sure. Because you're going to go on into perfection. You're going to be holy before God. You're going to be blameless before Him. And why is that so? Because you're not going to walk in sin. Because you shall never fall. That's quite a statement. We don't have to fall. Don't sit there and think that, well, we know we're probably always going to fall. That's wrong thinking. 
God says you shall never fall if you do what he says. In fact, we even know over from Jude, in verse 24, he says this, Now unto him that's able to keep you from falling, the Lord's able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless or without blemish. You see, if you don't fall, you will be gone on to perfection. If you don't fall, you will be blameless, you'll be without spot, you'll be undefiled before the Lord without any blemish. And that's what God is going to bring you to here on this earth in your walk, not when you get to heaven. Now, we're going to be brought to that place as we walk in line with His Word. Praise God. There's some things that are important that we've got to get established in. Certainly, we've got to get established in love. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, love towards God, love towards man. 1 Thessalonians 3.12 says, The Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all. Men was just added in. Even as we do towards you. To the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness. As you walk in love, which you're commanded to walk in, your heart's going to get established unblameable. See, God wants your heart to be so pure. You know, so the Bible says the pure in heart are going to see God. Those that aren't pure in heart, they're not going to see Him. Heart unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. This is talking about the second coming of Jesus when He comes back. The word is here is the parousia. That's the word for the second coming of Jesus Christ. So you need to increase and abound in love, and you're going to have your heart established unblameable in holiness. We see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, the very God of peace sanctify you holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y. That's the whole person. I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the parousia, coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That means as God accomplishes full sanctification work to bring you to holiness, spirit, soul, and body, you are going to be preserved, kept blameless. Otherwise, you can abide in that place of being blameless, being holy, being undefiled, being without spot. That's what God is going to bring us to as we allow the sanctification work to be accomplished in our life. We see another scripture over in James, chapter 1. Verse 27 says, Pure religion and undefiled, something that's not soiled or defiled, before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless, and the widows in their affliction. Affliction means their pressure. We need to reach out to those and help them. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. You gotta keep yourself unspotted from the world. That's why you gotta be separate from the ways of this world. So, we gotta be separate from the world. We've gotta also see this, this work be accomplished in us to bring us to the place where we're holy before the Lord. These are all important points for you to come to the place of being holy, without blame, without spot, and undefiled before Him. We see over in Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, and God's going to do this through the Word in you. Philippians 2, 14, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Don't be a murmur, don't be complaining, don't be disputing, arguing, getting into little strifey things, that you may be blameless and harmless. This particular word when it talks about harmless, this is talking about something which means without mixture, without any kind of mixture, unmixed with any kind of evil or anything that would contaminate you. We're not to be mixed with anything that is evil. So you're going to come to the place of being blameless and unmixed with any evil. And this is because of the fact that you don't murmur and you don't get into disputes. You don't let yourself get into those kind of things. And notice he says, the sons of God, this is actually the word technon, it really means the children of God, without rebuke, without rebuke, blameless, they can't be censured. See, God's bringing you to the place to be blameless and without rebuke. All these scriptures are declaring what he's going to bring us to. In the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Here we are in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, a world dominated by the devil, the Bible says as we go down these last days road that evil men will wax worse and worse, and they will. 
At the same time, the church is going to get more holy and more holy and brighter and lighter and the glory of God manifests. It's going to be such a tremendous separation between them. But you and I are to be blameless, without rebuke, unmixed by any evil in the midst of this crooked and perverse nation because we are going to be holy before them. Also, as you go out to witness, you're going to find that there's all kinds of people out there and as you're in this world, you're going to find that there's going to be wolves that will come after you. Matthew 10, 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Wolves trying to devour you. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless. Same word, unmixed with evil as doves. God wants us to be wise. That's going to come through the word of God that we hear and do and act upon in our life and produce in wisdom. And also we're going to be unmixed. We've got to be separate and not let ourselves be contaminated by anything of sin, anything of the flesh, anything of this world. We've got to put the Word of God first place, and that is so important. That's the way you're going to come to this place of being un undefiled, one who's going to be without spot, who's going to be blameless before the Lord. We see another scripture over in Romans chapter 16. All these scriptures are showing you the fact that you can be this way right now in this world as we grow up in the things of God. Romans 16, 19, he says, For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I'm glad, therefore, on your behalf. But he had something else to say, him, say to him. He says, But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple, the same word which actually means unmixed with evil, unmixed with evil, concerning evil. Again, apparently they were being obedient, but they weren't being wise unto everything. And they were not allowing them, they were allowing themselves to get mixed and affected by some evil things at the same time. That's why we've got to be separate from all these things. Over in 2 Peter, it says over here in chapter 2, beginning here in verse 10. He says, speaking of those who walk after the flesh, chiefly them that walk after the flesh, people that walk after the flesh, they're not going to be without blemish. They're not going to be holy and undefiled or blameless in the lust of uncleanness. You've got to deal with the lust of the flesh. You've got to crucify that flesh daily and not give place to it. And also that despise government. Government is actually the word which means lordship. It's talking about someone who has dominion over you. It's the word where it come from, the word where we get lord from. It's translated lord. They despise anybody's lordship over them or telling them what to do. Oh, we've got to get rid of pride. We've got to be submissive to the Lord. If He's really your Lord, you're going to do what He says. Remember what He says over in Luke 6, 46? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Otherwise, Jesus is only Lord, a Lord in our life in the measure that we do what He says and obey Him. You just can't just say it and then go and do other things. No. So these people were despising Lordship. They were presumptuous. They were self-willed. These are all things you've got to eliminate in your life. We're going to get rid of the fleshly things. We're going to be submissive to the Lordship of Jesus because we're going to be a doer of the Word. We're not going to be self-willed. We're going to be submitted totally to the Lord. These people are speaking evil of dignities and all kinds of things. And he talks about down here in verse 13 that they're going to receive the reward of unrighteousness. That's a bad reward. They're going to be cooked. They're going to be in trouble. As they count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. These guys were following after pleasures of life. Spots they are and blemishes. These guys are spotted. These, these guys are not undefiled. And they're blemishes. They're disgrace even. Sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. These people were with them in the church. They were feasting with them. See, that's why you can't have fellowship with people that aren't walking right. We don't get around people that are walking disorderly goes on and says they had eyes full of adultery, cannot cease from sin. Don't let yourself have that. Beguiling unstable souls, a heart that they've exercised with covetous practices. Don't be covetous. I want, I want, I want, I want all these things. Be content in whatever state you're in. Be praying and looking for God to bring forth His promises in your life, but don't let yourself be covetous. Cursed children, as he says, which have forsaken the right way and have gone astray. The, what are they doing? They're, getting, they're walking the way of unrighteousness. They're going to get the wages of unrighteousness. It talks about these ones walking a wrong path. And over in Jude, it even speaks again about this. In Jude 1, verse 8, 
Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion. Here it's translated dominion, same word, lordship. Speak evil of dignities. These are the ones they speak evil of all things that they don't even know about. That's why we got to watch. Don't watch what words you speak. Don't, if you don't have something to say that you know is going to be right, don't be speaking. You want to watch what you're saying. Woe unto them, they've gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perishing the gainsaying of Korah. Rebellion, Korah was in rebellion. Balaam, he was after reward. Cain, the way of Cain, remember Cain just brought an offering to the ground while Abel brought the firstlings of what he had, which was the tithe. It was the tithe of what God had brought unto him, given unto him. Cain just did whatever he wanted to do. He wasn't submissive unto God. That shows you that people that won't be tithers, people that won't be submissive unto God, and put everything that he has for his first place, they're going on the wrong way. They're actually in rebellion unto the Lord. He goes on and says, these are spots in your feasts of charity. Spots. Oh, we can't. God doesn't want any spots in us. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Feeding themselves, just doing whatever they want to do. They didn't have the fear of God before them. Clouds they are without water. Something with, without water, they haven't got anything. What's the water in the scriptures? The word of God. So these guys don't have any word in them whatsoever. Carried about of winds. What are we carried about of winds? Remember we saw about carried about with all these winds of doctrine. They're just going from here to here every which way. They're just blowing any way. Whatever wind blows their situation. Trees whose fruit withered. <laughs> all their fruit's gone. These guys had fruit apparently at one time. So they're, we're talking about Christians here. But their fruit withered. Without fruit now, these guys now, they've got nothing. They, their fruit is all gone. Twice dead. They've died out. In fact, it's interesting that people that pursue after pleasurable things, God considers that they're dead. I'll show you a scripture. It's a scripture that I hadn't even seen until recently. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 6, or I'd seen quite how this, what this says. She, talking about a person who liveth in pleasure, luxuriously. Otherwise, they're just living for all the pleasures of life, living luxuriously, is dead while she liveth. In fact, this particular word, when it says is dead, is a word which is in the perfect tense. It actually means she has died from God's standpoint. Someone that's sitting there feeding themselves after their lusts and all these things, and living luxuriously, just doing all the things they want to, living unto themselves. These guys are dead. These are the ones that we talk about. They have died out because they have turned away from the Lord. Well, God wants us to be those that are going to walk in the ways of the Lord. And that back to chapter Jude, in, in Jude uh, down here in verse 23, we see something he says. He says, Say, others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Again, what's going to hinder us if we have fleshly works? We're spotted by the flesh. We're defiled by the flesh. This is why it is of absolute necessity that you crucify the flesh daily and turn away from it. Also, what else would cause someone not to be uh, holy and without blame before God? In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, it says, marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. They are defiled. They are defiled. So many have fallen into fornication, have fallen into all kinds of sexual sin. For whoremongers is pornos, any kind of sexual sin, including pornography, all these kind of things, lust of the eyes. You're going to get judged. You're not going to ever be holy before God and undefiled and without spot and blameless before him. That's why we got to be sure we're not giving place to the devil through any kind of sexual sin. Because whoremongers and adulterers, and you can be an adulterer not just by participating in it. Remember, if you look on a woman with lust in your heart, you committed adultery. And if you have eyes full of adultery, as it said, we saw the same thing. That's why we got, really got to guard ourselves and not give place to these areas of sin. Titus chapter 1, verse 15. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. How are they defiled? Even their mind and conscience is defiled. 
That's why you don't want to let anything come into your mind that is not of the Lord. Watch your thoughts. Take your thoughts captive. Think on good things. Be ready to cast down the imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Don't let any negative thoughts get into you. It actually is defiling you. This is why we are going to govern our mind, keep our mind stayed on the things of the Lord. We see another place how people get defiled. Over in Hebrews chapter 12, these are all things we need to eliminate in our life. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. He says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Why is that? Because with the bitterness in you, you're going to be spewing out bitterness wherever you go, and you're going to start contaminating other people as well. That's why you've got to let go of the bitterness. Have you had negative things in your life happen? Forgive. Let it go. Start casting out those spirits of bitterness. You cannot allow a root of bitterness to get a hold of you. It has defiled you. And it will defile other people because you'll spew out your bitterness at others. You've got to absolutely turn away from it. Another thing that hinders us from being holy and without blame before God. James chapter 3 says over here in verse 6, he says, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, or this means unrighteousness. It's the word adakia. So is the tongue among our members. It defileth the whole body. Your tongue, your mouth can defile your whole body. That's why I watch your words. Death and life from the power of the tongue. God wants us to speak a good report. We really need to get a hold of our mouth and only speak a good report. Remember, we saw about the guy who's the perfect man. Who is he? He's the guy who doesn't, if any man offends not in his word or speech, the same is a perfect man. So we're not going to let our tongue set on fire our whole body and defile us. That's what it'll do. He goes on and he says down here in verse 9, Therewith bless we God, even the Father. Therewith curse we men, who are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Keep a lid or a bridle on that tongue. Keep a watch over the door of your lips, the Bible talks about. Bridle that tongue. Back, back in James chapter 1, down in verse, we saw verse 27, but 26 says, Any man among you seems to be religious, bridles not his tongue, he deceives his own heart. His religion is vain, it's profitless, it's devoid of any, any uh, purpose or usefulness. It's like you're just living, you're just going around, just walking around as the way of the world. No. God wants you to get things in line in the area of our mouth. In fact, we even see in Revelation, here's a scene of those who will be in heaven, having come out of the, the tribulation. Revelation 14, 5, it says, In their mouth was found no guile, no deceit. They, didn't, they spoke right things. For they are without fault, without blemish, before the throne of God. That's what God's going to bring you and I to. We're going to come to the place that we're going on to perfection. We're going to be without blemish. We're going to be without spot. We're going to walk blameless. We're going to be undefiled before the Lord. 2 Peter chapter 2. This is why if people don't talk about sin and dealing with all these things out there in the churches, the people are never going to deal with their problems. And they got all this defilement in them, and they're never going to ever get to the place of holiness. Over in 2 Peter, Chapter 1, where we were looking before, but let's go to verse 19, or verse 20. It says, if after they have escaped the pollutions, the word pollutions is, is a different word, but it means that which defiles, that which defiles. If we've escaped that which defiles of the world, because everything in the world is going to defile you, if you allow yourself to, to be walking in the ways of the world. In fact, we know from James 4.4, 4, it says we're a spiritual adulterers and adulteresses. Friendship of the world makes us an enemy against God. You're in the world, but you're not of the world, and you, don't, you can be separate from the world system. If after they have escaped the defilements of the world, how'd they do it? Through the knowledge. Remember this word knowledge? Precise and correct knowledge. And that was an integral part of you going on to perfection and growing up in the Lord, having precise and correct, exact knowledge, as we see the meaning is. Through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, if they're entangled again, entangled therein, and they go right back into it and overcome. The latter end 
is worse than from the beginning. That's why, as we're coming out of bondage, don't ever let yourself go back into bondage in an area of your life. If this thing's put underfoot, it's staying underfoot forever. You're through with it. You're through with the ways of the world. You're through with the works of the flesh. You're through with these areas of sin. You're through with letting the lusts, you know, dominate you and overtake you. We've got to watch that we don't give place to the enemy. In Romans chapter 1, verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. What's a reprobate mind? One that's not approved to do those things that are not convenient. If you don't have your mind renewed to the truth, and your mind is, is doing all, thinking all these other things, you're, you have an unapproved mind. Your mind is not standing the test. And what's going to happen? You'll end up doing all these evil things. And what all these guys end up doing? Filled with all the unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignancy, whispers. This is all fleshly stuff that defiles you. You don't want to get into contention or strife or debate with people either. Someone comes around like that, you just dust off the feet and move on. Don't allow yourself to fall, fall into that. Whispers, those people that are slandering, no, we're not going to do that. Backbiters. Speaking evil, defaming people, haters of God, despiteful, proud's in this list. Pride has to be dealt with in everybody. Otherwise, you're defiled. Get rid of the pride. Humble yourself. Boasters, talking about all the things I've done. Just You can find out if somebody's a boaster, just if they all talk about I, 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 me, 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 and they're all talking about all the things they've accomplished, you know. Those are boasters. Inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, Sure sounds like the world today, doesn't it? It's exactly what they're like. Without understanding, covenant breakers, breaking covenants left and right, without natural affection, incomplacable, unmerciful. People are unmerciful, you know. You get around somebody that doesn't like the way you drove, road rage character rises up and wants to go after you. I mean, people are crazy out there. That's why you better bind the demons in these people. God will protect you, though. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, they only, not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them. They like doing them. That's the way they are when they, the devils run people. Remember how it was even before the flood? It got so bad that every imagination of their heart was evil continually only. Can you imagine that? How bad things were? Well, wax in, old, in this day and age, people are going to get worse and worse as well. Evil men are going to wax worse and worse, it says. We see another thing that we've got to watch so we don't let any defilement come into us. We can't be resistant to God's word. 2 Timothy 3.8 speaks of Janus and Jambres. Withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate, not approve concerning the faith. Now, they're not blameless. They're not without spot because... They're resisting the truth. Always be receptive to the Word of God. Examine things whether they're the truth or not, but don't resist the truth. God is wanting to bring the truth to us, to bring us to the place of repentance, to change our life, to bring us to what He purposes for us. Hebrews chapter 6 talks about those that aren't bringing forth fruit. And they're bringing forth evil things. It says, that which is beareth thorns and briars. That's not what God wants. That's what the devil brings forth is rejected, not approved, is nigh to cursing, whose end is to be burned. Uh, they don't make it, do they? They're burned up, bearing the wrong stuff. They're rejected. They're nigh unto cursing. We see another scripture over in 1 Corinthians. Even Paul even said this. He said how he could be one who could be unapproved if he didn't do what he needed to do. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. I keep under my body, bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Same word. Adokimos. Not approved. Not approved. A castaway. Tossed aside. Paul says, I could even be that. What's he do? He keeps under his body. The key word keep under is, is a word which literally means to beat black and blue like you're smiting this thing and beating up someone like you're boxing it, essentially. Now, you don't literally do that. But what you do, you, keep, you stay on top of your body that your body does not lead you into sin at any time in your life. You do whatever you got to do to get this body doing the right thing. 
because the Spirit is the only way you're going to walk after. And then he says, bring it into subjection. That means you lead it away into slavery. That's what that word means. You're going to make it your slave. Your body's your slave. It doesn't run you. That's why it fasts for a while. That'll tell your body who's boss. The Spirit says, we're going to fast for a while. We're going to cut off some of this. And you're going to fight. You're not going to just do what you want to do. Well, you need to not let the body run you. Any desires, feelings, all these kind of things from the flesh. Otherwise, we could be a castaway. It's important that we keep the flesh under control. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, over here in verse 5, he says this, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. Now, what's a reprobate? Actually, it's below this. It's the same word, a dokimos, one who's not approved. He says, Jesus is in you, except you be not approved. Means he's not in you if you're not approved. That tells you something. That's why we can't be one of those that have a mind that's not approved. What's he say? You're going to prove yourselves. You're going to examine yourselves whether you're in the faith. God wants you to prove yourself. Test, examine yourself. Put yourself under a microscope about my words, my thoughts, my, my actions, my, my attitudes, all these kinds of things. See, we're not going to let the devil have place. This is the devil coming in and bringing destruction. How did all the demons get into us? Through all these open doors. No, we're turning the tables on the devil, and we're going to put him underfoot. That's why we've got to get the word in us, and we've got to walk in line with the word of God. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, he says this, See then that you walk circumspectly. The word circumspectly means exactly and accurately. That's what this word akribos means. Exactly and accurately. Not, I'm trying my best. No, exactly and accurately. How can you walk exactly and accurately? Because you know what the Word says, and you're making sure you do it. Not as fools, but as wise. Who walks accurately and exactly? The wise person. Who doesn't? Who just walks whatever they want? God says, that person's a fool. We don't want to be classified a fool in God's sight. No, we want to walk the right way. We also got to deal with sin in our life. We got to put away all sin. 1 John 3, verse 4 says, Whosoever commits sin transgresses the law. Sin is the transgression of the law. Or we're walking, it's lawlessness. It's the word, Greek word, anomia. Whenever we sin, we actually are participating in lawlessness. And that is very important because lawlessness is what is going to contaminate the end time. As we see in Matthew 23, verse 28, he says this, even so also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but in, within are full of hypocrisy and iniquity, which is anomia, meaning lawlessness. That's why we've got to put God's Word first place in our life. You do so, then the Word will work to bring you to the place of being holy before Him, without spot, without blemish, undefiled, unrebukable before the Lord. That's where He's going to bring us to. Now certainly that means we can't be having fellowship with people that are not right with God. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship, who you spend time with, hath righteousness, which is who you are, with unrighteousness, which is really anomia, which really means lawlessness. This is why Young corrects all these errors that they make. What fellowship does someone who's righteous with someone who's lawless? You don't want to have anything to do with people that are lawless. I don't care who they are, family members, whatever. You don't want to have any, you know, people, you know, your friends you've known for years, so what? You don't want to have fellowship with those people. What communion is light with darkness? You see, he goes on and he says, what conquereth Christ with Belial? None is the answer to all these. What a part, he that believeth an infidel? None. What agreement of the temple of God with idols? None. You're the temple of the living God, as God said, I'll dwell in them, walk in them, and I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. And then he says, wherefore, come out from among them and be separate. The word separate is a word which means to mark off by boundaries. Set the boundaries. I'm not crossing these boundaries. In relationships, friendships, whoever, you know, who I'm going to be with, I'm not crossing these boundaries, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. 
and I'll receive you. That means if we're touching the unclean things, we're not going to be received. You see, you've got to understand this lawlessness. The lawlessness is what Satan is working. In fact, in 2 Thessalonians, it talks about in verse, chapter 2, verse 7, the mystery of iniquity, which is lawlessness, is already working. And it refers to the Antichrist who comes on the scene as the lawless one. Then shall that wicked anim animos, which means the lawless one, again from the word anomia, be revealed. Lawlessness is going to come in these last days greatly. And it's going to take down a great many of people in the body of Christ because they're not doing what God tells them to do. Matthew 24, verse 12, look what it says. Because iniquity, or anomia, lawlessness shall abound. This is Matthew 24, the end times chapter. The love of how many? Not a couple, not a few. Many shall wax cold. Isn't there going to be a falling away? It's because lawlessness is going to grip them. The love of many. This is not talking about the world. Because love is agape love. See, there's agape. Who has agape love? Only Christians, not the world. The love, agape love of many, shall wax cold because of lawlessness getting a hold of them. That's why you've got to separate yourself from anything that is not of the Lord. We cannot allow ourselves to be involved. See, you've got to understand, Jesus hates lawlessness. And that's any time we walk contrary to God's words. All sin is lawlessness. Hebrews 1, 9, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated... Zoe always trans uh, translated iniquity in the King James for some reason instead of lawlessness. Hated lawlessness. Jesus hated lawlessness. And that's exactly what you and I should have. An absolute hatred of lawlessness in our life. We don't want to have anything to do with it whatsoever. In fact, that's why God tells us in Romans... Romans chapter 6, over here in verse 19. Romans 6, 19, he says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as you've yielded your members, what's your members? All your faculties, your mind, your mouth, what you're hearing, what you're seeing, you know, your tongue, speaking, all these things, your steps, who you're involved with, and so forth. As you've yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, and to lawlessness, what does that do? Unto, which produces more lawlessness. The same thing. It's lawlessness to the lawlessness, more lawlessness. Again, this is the devil working. The devil wants to be sure that you don't do the word of God. Do something else. That's lawlessness because it becomes sin. Just walk around on the flesh, enjoy and do all these things. In fact, enjoy your luxurious living like it talked about the one. Lawlessness gets a hold of you. No, he says, now present your members. What are we supposed to do? As it said, that now we're to yield our members, servants, to righteousness, unto holiness. Your mind is a servant to righteousness. You're only going to think on what's right, or you're going to take that thought captive and cast it down. Your mouth is a servant of righteousness. You're only going to speak what God says you're going to speak. You're not going to speak evil. Your eyes are eyes of righteousness. You don't want to see anything that is evil that Jesus would not see. That eliminates almost all that you see out there on the TV land or the movie land. It's almost all of it is trash. It's not good whatsoever. You don't want to see those things. You don't want to hear those things. You don't want any of this stuff to come to you. You want to yield your members of servants to righteousness. What's that do? That produces holiness in your life. And what's evidence of holiness? It says here, now being made free from sin, servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness. Fruit in your life. That's why, how do you know somebody? By their fruits. That's why we talked about bringing forth fruit, more fruit, and much fruit in our life. God wants you to be sure that you are bringing forth the fruit of the Lord. How's it going to happen? Because you're going to do the Word. And when you do the Word, what's going to happen? You're going to be seeing you're going to come to the place of being holy before God. You're going to be coming to the place that you're going to be without blemish, blameless before God. See, we've got to see, Matthew 7, 20 says, Wherefore, by their fruits you'll know them. That's the way God knows us. That's the way we know everybody else, too. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven. 
Anybody can say words. That doesn't make it. That's why just people that get born again and just confess Jesus as Lord, if they don't start following and walking in His ways, they're not going to enter in. But he that doeth the will of my Father, and the word doeth is not, I just did it once or twice. No, present continuous action, ongoing action, the present tense. He that continually does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. But what's the next verse say? Many, and this will probably be part of the fall away crowd. It is going to be part of the fall away crowd. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? These are Christians. They had the Holy Spirit. They were prophesying. They were operating the gifts of the Spirit. And in thy name have cast out devils. They knew their authority. They were using their authority and casting demons out of people. And in my name, in thy name, done many wonderful works. They knew the name of Jesus. They were doing the works of God. These are Christians. No question about it. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work anemia lawlessness. And what were they doing? They weren't just working at once. Lawlessness is going to abound, remember? Present tense, ongoing action. They were continually working lawlessness. Because the lawlessness will abound, the love of many will wax cold. That's why it's imperative that you cut off sin in your life, because that produces lawlessness. You got to understand what it talks about over in Hebrews. We'll go over there for a moment. Hebrews, in chapter uh, 3, down here in verse uh, 12, I think it is, yes, and 13. It says, Exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is lawlessness. So anytime you commit sin, it's also having a hardening effect upon your heart. And the more your heart gets hardened, the harder it is for you to come to the place of repentance. God wants us to be sure that we're not walking in sin. Otherwise, we are going to be hardening our heart. Now, if you do sin, what do you do? Confess your sin immediately. He's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So these guys that are working lawless are going to hear, depart from me. They're finished. We even see it again in Matthew 13, verse 41. What's he say? The Son of Man shall send forth his angels and shall gather out of his kingdom. Who's in his kingdom? All the believers. All things that offend and them, that's people, which do lawlessness. And this is talking about people that have been doing lawlessness. And these people, again, weren't just doing it once in a while. They were continually doing it. This is the fallaway crowd, see? Those that are doing lawlessness. What's going to happen to these guys? He's going to cast them a furnace of fire. It's, that's strong. That's why these people, are, are going to, when they have a fall away, they're going to be through. They're going to be in trouble. That's why it's essential that we deal with areas of sin in our life and walk above reproach before the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at verse 10. Look what the statement he makes. You are witnesses to God also how holily, justly, so holy and justly means righteous, and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. These guys are walking in holiness, they're walking in righteousness, doing what's right, and they were unblameable, unblameable before the Lord. Well, that's the way we're going to be. You just set your sights. I'm going to be that way. Colossians 1.21, he says, You who were sometime alienated an enemy in your mind by wicked works, yet now is he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you, what? Holy, unblameable, unreprovable, can't be called into account, unaccused, you know, blameless in his sight. What's the condition, though? If you continue in the faith grounded, that means the foundation laid. See, this grounded means to lay the foundation, if you notice, in the lower window. It's the word of low. And settled, immovable, established. Nothing can move you whatsoever. That's why, how are you going to get to the place the foundation laid and you're immovable? The word in you. And there's only one way you're going to do it. Hearing and doing and hearing and doing and hearing and doing and hearing and doing the word. 
So it's so established in you, this is the way you think, this is the way you act, this is the way you speak, this is what you do in everything you do. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. See, that's what these people are going to do. They're going to be moved away from the hope of the gospel because they're doing lawlessness. So what's going to be if you continue in faith and you're not moved away from the hope of the gospel and you've got the foundation laid and you're, you're immovable? You're going to be presented holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in the sight of the Lord. Praise God. See, that's why the gospel is so important as we get it to people. It says, we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect. Perfection. You and I are going to go on into perfection. Even here, back in 1 Timothy chapter 3, he speaks to those who could be servers in the church. 1 Timothy 3.10, let these also first be proved. They've got to be examined to see if they're right. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. The deacon was someone who was serving, just serving and helping out. Anybody who would be a server had to be blameless. I wonder how many people that are servers in the church could even qualify in the early, early church that people allow them to serve in the church today. Blameless. God wants you to be, that's, that's what he expects for every one of us. 1 Timothy 3, back there in verse 2. He's talking about a bishop who's an overseer. He must be blameless. First thing it says about him, blameless. He starts listing all these different things that he's supposed to be. Husband of one wife, vigilant, sober. This means the fact that this person is not a polygamist. Several wives, that's what it's talking about. Vigilant, sober, sound mind, good behavior, given hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no alcohol, no striker, he doesn't get into quarrels, not greedy of filth or lucre, lucre, you know, not thinking money, 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 but patient, not a brawler, and not covetous. These are just all things that, this shows a person is going to be without blemish, that's going to be blameless before the Lord. That was actually re absolutely required. We see over in Titus, Chapter 1, pick up here in verse 7. The bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry. People have got a sharp t temper, quick temper, they can't be an overseer. They're not blameless. Not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, as he says. Lover of hospitality, lover of good men, sober, just, righteous, holy, temperate, and here he goes on and says, holding fast the faithful word as he's been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. Holding fast the word, having the word established in you. See, God wants us to come to the place. You get all these things established in you, what's going to happen? You're going to be going, you've, you'll have gone unto perfection. You'll come to the place of being without blame, holy before the Lord. These people were that way. That shows you, hey, if these guys could be that way, no reason we can't be that way. 1 Timothy 5, 7, he says, these things give in charge, all the things that he's been talking about, all these different things he's telling them what to do, that they may be blameless. Give these people, charge them, command them, order them, that they may be blameless before the Lord. Then he says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, he gives commands. He's saying, flee these things, follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. That's a command. Lay hold on eternal life. That's a command. Whereunto you're called and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. And then he comes down to verse 14. He says that thou keep this commandment without spot, spotless, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. These people were hearers and doers of the word. They were serious about following God and walking his ways. That's what God is bringing us all to today. In fact, over in 2 Peter, in chapter 3, verse 14, he says this, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, and what are we talking about? Looking for the new heaven, the new earth that's going to come, wherein dwells righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of them in peace without spot, blameless. We see this over and over and over, time after time, book after book after book, verse after verse, without spot and blameless. 
And what kind of a church is Jesus going to present to himself? Ephesians chapter 5 tells us. These are the ones that are going to be presented to him at the coming of Jesus. That he might present it to himself a glorious church is going to have the glory of God, be honored before him, not having spot, no spots, no moral blemishes, no wrinkles, no any such thing. It should be holy and without blemish. No blemish. Unrebukable. Unreprovable. That is what God is bringing us all to. God wants us to walk blameless, without spot and undefiled before the Lord. We can do it. You've got to set, first of all, that's where I'm headed. We're not ever going to give place to the flesh whatsoever. If they did it in the Old Testament, walking blameless, when they weren't even born again, how much more can we do it today? We're born again. We've got the Holy Spirit. We've got the Word written in our heart and mind. There's no reason in the world that we can't walk blameless before the Lord. So he says that we're going to be blameless, and it's going to be coming to pass through the Word of God that's going to do the work in your life. He's going to present us faultless before Him. We're going to be guarded from falling. Remember, we're going to keep ourselves from falling. We're going to increase and abound in love. That talks about spiritual growth coming forth. We're going to be sanctified and preserved blameless. We're going to be unspotted from the world. We're not going to do things with murmurings and disputings. That's all the flesh. We do everything unto the Lord, not unto men. That you might be blameless and harmless in the midst of this crooked, perverse world. In the midst of the wolves, you're going to be wise and you're going to not let yourself be mixed with any kind of evil whatsoever. You're not going to walk in the flesh any longer. You're not going to be spots and blemishes by living luxuriously in their deceivings. God doesn't want us to live. Now, he wants us to have our needs met. He wants us to have, you know, everything and, and, and gives us all things richly to enjoy. But we're talking about someone who's just living for pleasures of life, totally living to themselves. No, we're not going to live to ourselves. We're going to live unto God. The Bible even says, Scripture you ought to take note of, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, over here in verse 16, or verse uh, 15, excuse me, that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. What are you doing? You're living unto him. You don't live unto yourself. You live unto the Lord, and you do what he says, and he's going to lead you and guide you in the right way. We see that we're not going to be garment, our garment's not going to be spotted by the flesh. We're not about to get in any sexual sin. We're not going to let our mind or conscience get defiled. We're going to not have any kind of bitterness in our life. We're going to only speak good things out of our mouth. We're not going to let ourselves get, escape from the pollutions of the world and then fall back into it. No, we're not going to backslide whatsoever. We're not going to be those that resist the truth and have an unapproved mind before God because of no fruit or because of the fact that we haven't kept our body under and brought it in to be a slave. Your body's a slave to you. You can make your body do what, it want, what the Spirit says. The Spirit's the master, and we're going to prove ourselves, and we are going to show the fact that we're going to be approved before God, and we're going to walk accurately in line with His Word, and we're not going to let lawlessness get a hold of us. Lawlessness gets a hold of you if you walk in sin. That's why if you do sin, run to the Lord, confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness immediately, and He won't remember your sins and iniquities anymore. Don't ever let yourself wallow in areas of sin. Yield your members and servants to righteousness so you have fruit unto holiness, and the end of that is everlasting life. Do the will of the Father continuously, and you'll have fruit. You'll walk without blemish. You'll be one that's walking undefiled and blameless without spot before the Lord. But if we walk in the ways of lawlessness, regardless of what your past has been, you start walking in lawlessness, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to hear, depart from me. Well, we're not about to think about that. We're, you let that allow, allow that to happen to us. We're going to be holy, righteous, unblameable, continue in faith and hope. We're going to be those that are going to meet the conditions, so we're blameless in all areas, keeping the commandments of God without spot and unrebukable, knowing the fact that if we don't fall, we will, because we do the Word of God, we will always be in holiness and in righteousness, and we will be right with the Lord and have gone on into perfection. 
very important. We're going to be diligent to be found in peace without spot and blameless. No spot, no wrinkle, holy and without blemish. That's the ones that are presented unto the Lord. Now, if God says all this and it's clear as a bell that this is what we're to be, can we be this? Absolutely. How's it happen? Just simply doing the Word. Doing the Word and keeping what was separate from the world. Watch what you yield your members to. Crucify the flesh. Live unto God. Get His Word in you. The Word will change you and transform you. Here and do it, here and do it, here and do it, here and do it. And you're bringing forth fruit, more fruit, much fruit. A real disciple. And you conquer every area of sin in your life and you are going to be going on to perfection and you will see the fulfillment of walking blameless, without spot, and undefiled before the Lord. Say this to me. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God, which is good news. God's Word will bring me to the place of being blameless, without spot, undefiled, unrebukable, unreprovable, without rebuke, holy before the Lord, as I hear and do your word, and as I crucify the flesh daily, separate from the ways of the world, only yield my members unto righteousness, I will see fruit unto holiness, and I will be one of those who are blameless, no spot, no wrinkle, holy, undefiled, without blemish. And I am going to be one of those who will be presented to the Lord if Jesus comes back during my lifetime. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to walk blameless. Anytime I might sin, I will immediately confess that sin, receive forgiveness and cleansing, repent and turn from it, get the word in me, hear and do it, so that I will bring forth fruit and conquer that in my life. Thank you, Lord. I am going on to perfection, and I will walk blameless, without spot, and undefiled before the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. You get your sights set on that, and you know where you're headed and what you're going to become. That's the way I'm going to be. You know, whatever you set your goal towards is what you're going to be. But you've got to have the right goal. If your goal is just kind of get along, try to do the best I can, that's all you'll outdo. But if we see the Word and we see now what God says, just like Paul said, i got this goal set before me for this victorious award, the prize that I'm going to possess, that we talked about. And I'm going to enter in and I'm going to possess the perfection of the Lord. That's what it talked about in Philippians. Chapter 3, we talked about in the last two times before this. You get yourself set on that. That's where you're headed. And it's just a matter of doing the Word. And the more you're built up in the things of God, they just come, you just walk in His ways. Just think of the areas where you've already got put underfoot that you wouldn't even give the time of day to that sin, or you'd never even give place to that for a second. You have conquered a lot of areas in your life. Well, there might be some other areas where you've got to deal with them. That's why also deliverance is important. Because all these demons will try to drive you to continue to sin. So as you cast out all the devils, you get yourself in the Word, and you walk and be a hearer and a doer of the Word, you and I are going to walk blameless, without spot, without rebuke, undefiled before the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, thank you and praise you that you're going to accomplish in every single one of us. Because we're going to hear and we're going to do your Word. And we're going to act, act on your word and cut off all the things of this world and the flesh and sin. And we're going to walk holy before you. Thank you, Father. There's going to be much fruit. And every one of us are going to be found to be blameless before you. Not only at the coming of the Lord, but in our life as we walk and follow you, living unto you. Thank you. There'll be much fruit in this message as we hear and do it. In Jesus' name, amen.